Uh, I guess let's get started. Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the Rideshare Electrification Panel. Thank you for tuning in from wherever you are. Uh, and if that's in the United States like me, I first want to acknowledge that we are on stolen lands of approximately 600 tribes and millions of indigenous people that were and still are impacted by genocide and colonialism. I myself in Portland, Oregon, am on the unceded land of the Cowlitz and Clackamas people and the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and Silent Indians. I'm Lindsay Schelke. I'm a cis white woman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm wearing a black blouse with a bow and a periwinkle cardigan. I'm a program manager at Forth, and I'll be helping guide the conversation today. I've worked on programs focused on TNC electrification which stands for Transportation Networking Company, also known as Rideshare Company, doing outreach, research, and financing programs at Forth. The topic of rideshare electrification matters because there are major emissions implications in this industry. The Union of Concerned Scientists found that TNC rides create an average of 69% more emissions than the rides that they replace. But with these high mileage cars, there are opportunities for scaling uh, electrification more broadly. However, there are equity questions as this occurs. Drivers can put on hundreds of miles in a single day and pay hundreds of dollars a week in gas, maintenance, and other expenses doing this work. Therefore, investing in an EV helps drivers to save on their fuel and maintenance costs. Unfortunately, only around 1% of rideshare drivers are in all electric cars currently. At this time, the cost to rent or the upfront cost to own an EV is steep for most drivers because access to cars and access to charging is easier for people with more resources. I'm going to ask panelists and us all to consider the large driver workforce deemed essential and making this service happen to consider their needs as the push for electrification of rideshare occurs. If you have questions as we go through the conversation, please put them in the Q&A tab and we will address some questions later. There will also be a poll question uh, and that will activate shortly to be able to provide feedback on this panel. And now I'd like for the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, Kamasu, let's start with you. All right, happy to start it off. Uh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here with everyone. Um, looking forward to learning more about what the other industries that are happening and all the things that are happening around this space. Uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Kamasi Livingston. I'm from San Francisco, California. Uh, I've been working in the sustainability and electric vehicle space since about 2009. Uh, worked with some OEMs, uh, Nissan, BMW, um, helped bring out the i3, um, also BMW's electric car sharing program, which was called Drive Now, which we launched here in San Francisco and then moved it up to Seattle and Portland and uh, rebranded it as Drive Now and Reach Now. So worked on that, also worked on the first Leaf as well as the i3, the i8, uh, most recently did a 15-month uh, launch with Polestar on the Polestar 2. So kind of putting another electric premium vehicle in the market, uh, you know, going kind of in co competition with Tesla, as well as on the other side of it, I am also a rideshare driver. I've done over 12,000 electric rides with Uber. So I'm a pretty seasoned Uber driver as well. And it's all been in my various electric vehicles over my, over my tenure. So uh, I love electric vehicles. I love the infrastructure. I love everything that's going and just trying to, be here to add in extra information from the driver's perspective as well as from the cons consumer's perspective as well. Thank you, Kamasu. Uh, let's pass it over to Raven. Yeah, Raven Hernandez uh, from Earth Rides. We utilize electric vehicles in a rideshare platform. Uh, we launched in Nashville um, October 2020 and recently launched in Austin on August, this past August of 2021. Um, I'm based here in Austin, but originally from Nashville. We're really focused on 
bringing electric vehicles to the mainstream and showing people that they are an option in their lifestyles. We have a fleet that we own and we have drivers that we employ as well as independent contractors who own their own electric vehicles. Um, and I'm in a gray sweater with a turtleneck. Thanks, Raven. And Adam? Thanks, Lindsay. I'm Adam Gromus. I lead global sustainability policy at Uber. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, if you couldn't tell, I'm an all too typical looking white guy with brown hair and green <laughs> eyes with Northern European heritage and Pennsylvania Dutch German heritage. And uh, I'm very pleased and privileged to be uh, on this panel, uh, listening and learning as much as I will be sharing from uh, my experience. Uh, I've worked in all three sectors in uh, government sector and nonprofit and in industry. And throughout my career, I've been an advocate for uh, clean vehicle technology and commercialization. And my fundamental belief is that we can't solve unprecedented, enormous challenges like climate and local air pollution without the best of government policy and regulation and the best that industry can innovate on. Uh, so I'm very pleased to be joining you today in my capacity of working for Uber and uh, learning and, and sharing with you. Our experiences. Thank you. And Rock? Hi, I'm Rock Robinson. I am CEO of Oh, Rock, of you are on mute. I am? Uh, we can go over. I can hear you, Rock. Oh, doesn't see, let me doesn't see. show muted. Okay. Continue, Rock. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Cool. Sorry. Uh, my name is Rock Robinson, CEO of Ikara. You know, our mission is uh, really to uh, reduce emissions and accelerate the utilization of electric cars. Um, my background right out of high school, I got into logistics and transportation. I got into trucking business and started buying 18 wheelers when I was 21 and did it for about 10 years and kind of watched this uh, increase in gas and diesel and all of that mess and just decided that I wanted to not be in that again. And I love transportation. So uh, after my time at Apple, we decided to start a company to help uh, bring some utilization to electric cars. And so we actually just decided to go platform heavy. Our soft, we, we, we're just a software company. We, we do a little bit of transportation as a service that's kind of uh, how we do a lot of our learns, uh, but ideally what our model is, is to build software to help other entrepreneurs and other operators all over the world use electric cars to move pizza packages or people. It doesn't really matter if it's electric car or electric scooter. So uh, that's kind of our goal is to, to really uh, take and utilize some of these uh, technologies and air quality and emission savings and data and all this and make some sense out of it. So that's kind of what we get the pleasure to do. I go by rock, simple as that, can't mess that up. And I'm wearing a white hoodie. This is kind of one of my favorite soft hoodies that's cold today. So we rarely get cold days in Dallas and I'm, I'm loving the hoodie action today. So thank you for having me be a part of this. Thank you, Rock. And Marcus? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcus D. Weems, and I am our Driver Advocacy Community Manager at Lyft. I focus on uh, our Driver Advisory Council programs, National Driver Engagement Initiatives. I have also worked in uh, operations at Lyft um, and working and managing some of our driver hubs. And I myself uh, have been a Lyft driver um, since 2013, uh, and I drive my uh, Tesla Model 3 on the platform. Uh, I get out there and uh, it experience um, driving my electrical vehicle and really in love talking with other drivers about the opportunities and things that they may think about and consider as they are thinking about making the switch. Um, as many folks know, Lyft has made the commitment to have 100% of our cars be electric uh, in the future. And so working to kind of help educate our drivers and then also work on the policy side where we can make sure that we're providing the infrastructure around that can support our drivers uh, as well as kind of providing resources and uh, the education as they go. And I don't have as many rides um, as some um, of our panelists here. I'm only at about 3,600 rides. Um, so I got some work to do, so I better get out there and drive after this. So, but 
<laughs> glad to be here today. I'm wearing a lovely Argyle uh, shirt here, sweater, because it's cold here in the Bay Area as well um, as it is in Texas, it seems. And I use he, him, his pronouns, uh, and I'm biracial. Um, and so happy to really talk about kind of how this uh, EV strategies kind of impact our um, diverse communities of drivers as well. Awesome. Thank you all for being here. And uh, I'm very excited because my first question, I actually wanted to ask panelists that had driving experience about what the current needs that drivers have today. And uh, most of you have direct driving experience. So I I'm, I'm, want to ask first, kind of more broadly, what are the driver's needs I'll touch in. Um, I've driven on my platform quite a few rides. And I, I'd say visibility and, and a better understanding of their financial situation. You know, oftentimes we'll ask drivers on the array of platforms, you know, how much are you making an hour? How much of that is profit? And they're oftentimes unable to answer that question. And so I think um, pouring resources into answering those questions is definitely something that we need to do a better job as a better job in within Rideshare. Yeah, I, I, I would echo what Raven said. I think, you know, when you talk about drivers, it's not an easy, that's not an easy fix. There's a lot of scenarios and a lot of things that drivers uh, really need. And, and, I, and I'm going to, I'm going to kind of take a step back a little bit. At the end of the day, driving someone around is really an important job. And I think we need to get back to understanding that that's a really, really important job. And then treating those people as such right and so you know even though we've got this gig economy going on and it's and i be, I, I believe in it it's strong i feel like the gig economy is going to dominate at the end of the day um is the accountability piece of that actually structures these environments for people to have better work environments and balance and i so i think so it's a, it's about about money for sure getting paid right and having the proper pay, but it's also about, you know, work life balance, you know, and having a, 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 the time to go and do things that they love and, and actually uh, enjoy the reason why they own these, you know, gig work economies and things like that. So, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a lot of things. It's, it's a combination of, of money and time and flexibility and, you know, decent treatment. You know, when I used to Uber, I felt bad sometimes when I would get in the car because to, to a passenger, Sometimes it, you know, it's like they don't respect you for a person. It's like you're just my driver. Well, I'm doing something really important here. I'm taking you somewhere <laughs> safely, so you should be nice to me. <laughs> it's kind of one of those things. So the value of what we're doing, I think we need to get back to that, right? This it's it's a big deal. It's a lot of mobility is huge, and so what what we do in that car is super, super valuable. And we need to get, I think, start to focus on that. I think everybody has input on the solutions, but value of what we're doing is is one of those uh, key factors, I think, in understanding. Yeah, I would definitely piggyback on what Rock said. I mean, that's a huge component and it's kind of this missing piece of the equation. Um, you know, people moving around throughout a city and they're, you know, they may value what they're doing, whether they're, whether they're a lawyer or a doctor, or for a corporation, what have you, and they're moving throughout the city, and they're moving through the city, for the most part, pretty seamlessly um, through you know the rideshare technology. I mean, you, you open your phone, you see a heat map, you push a button, a vehicle shows up, and you know that vehicle takes you to go do this very important meeting or close this very important deal. But people forget that that vehicle is being driven by a person, and that person is a human being, and that person is that person is such an intricate component of this massive accomplishment that you're going to have for the day where you didn't sit at your house and get in your vehicle and then sit in traffic and drive for an hour. And then once you got to the location, spend another 45 minutes, which you didn't have because your meeting started at two and you arrived there at one fifty, and you got out of your, you got out of this vehicle and went into your meeting versus you would have been spending another 45 minutes or an hour. So that value proposition of that, person who's doing the driving and the ride share that you received is huge. And we definitely need to get back and, and put more emphasis and education to the public 
about how important that piece is and then really support drivers. Yeah, I would concur on what all the panels have said, um, specifically around like our drivers, right, on the platforms. Uh, when I get to meet with drivers and talk about why they drive, um, their, their own needs, as Rock mentioned, some folks like really need that flexibility and they need to be able to be a t their caretaker at home, but then they need to get out there and earn money as well when they have the, the opportunity to do so. Um, and being a rideshare driver allows them to do that. As it relates to kind of the electrification kind of things, some of the things that I think about our drivers need not only the education, but they also need some 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 support um, in kind of like that financial entry into electrical vehicle, electric vehicle, and then also kind of understanding um, of just kind of like what's what's going to be the the trade offs, right, that you may have. Um, so like if you have to do a ride that may be longer uh, and take you away from an area where there may not be a charger right now. We need to be able to provide that support where they have options in their areas, um, in all areas, and not just like on main highways um, and things like that. Um, and so I think those are some of the key things that we need to start really investing heavily in is not only the education component, but also kind of the infrastructure uh, to provide for those um, needs that they'll have when they own an electric vehicle. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm curious then um, on how these needs, such as support, direct support, um, transparency and compensation models, how that has helped inform, especially Raven and Rock, your uh, all electric from the get go businesses. And uh, Raven, why don't you start us off? I'm sorry, and the question was regarding the financial structure of electric vehicles specifically? Or I guess um, even, you know, broadly, how have you taken drivers' needs into account as you've built your business? Yeah, well, I mean, I'd say that electric vehicles are very, I mean, our, our drivers are so excited to get in these vehicles and drive them because if you've never driven an EV, I'll, I'll tell you right now, it, it's driving with you. You're not, you're not, you're not forcing yourself to drive. I mean, as simple as the regenerative braking, the impact and the force that your body has to output to drive is a lot, and you have to be very on point. And when you're behind an EV, there's so much less work that you have to do behind it, um, and so it makes the driver's job a lot easier and a lot safer when you've got these really awesome tools like electric vehicles. And then I think about the fact that when you're driving an EV all day, you're not polluting the environment around you. And so if everyone was driving an EV, you'd be on a road that doesn't have pollution. Right now, unfortunately, that's not the case. And so our drivers are you know, sitting in traffic where they're basically inhaling a pack of cigarettes because of all of the diesel and gas trucks around them. And so you know, it's just another reason to go electric when we're thinking about the driver. And as a follow up there, Raven, I'm curious about the onboarding of drivers as well, especially if drivers are new to the technology and uh, learning about operating an EV and charging and what kind of support you can provide through that process. Absolutely. For our employee drivers, we have a whole onboarding process and it's, you know, obviously paperwork and whatnot and kind of who we are and what we expect. But then it's mainly about driving the car and, you know, little things like, hey, wait to unplug until this turns a light blue and then pull out. Don't jiggle it out. You know, this this um, this feature here, you know, always keep it on uh, high regenerative braking. Also keep it on low for you know driving fast there's all these little nuances and again we, we you know it's funny we've had some drivers who who drove their own gas vehicles for rideshare and then they say hey you know i, I want to drive yours as an employee and we've had a couple about 30 minutes into it say this is too overwhelming like this is totally different i'm not used to it wait a second and then we say hey that's okay come off the road, let's do another training. And then they've been working with us, you know, for nine months, for a year. They're like, this is the best thing ever. And their excitement, you know, what's what's beautiful about an, 
a driver being excited about electric vehicle is that when that passenger gets in, they're going to feel that excitement and then they're going to leave with the same excitement. We've seen so many of our drivers and passengers go on to buy electric vehicles because we empower the driver. To us, the driver is the salesperson of this electric vehicle. They are truly they, they know everything about it and they're, they're talking it up and they're answering all the questions. And it's really exciting to empower drivers to, to kind of like how Rock said, like they're more than just getting you to work. They're, they're EV experts in, in a sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Rock, I, I'm curious about uh, your model, how you've been able to build it and support drivers and what makes Ecara unique. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, for for us, you know, Ikara is really is not about ride sharing. We're really about customer service. Um, and when we when we decided to be about customer service, it actually changed the dynamic of everything we do, including the way our guides, our drivers, we call them guides, because we feel like their 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 role is more of awareness and education and support and you know customer service so we we look at them as guides and we treat them as such so for us uh there's a lot of things like for example our 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 review system right so we built the platform to review the company not the driver so we say all the time like if a driver messes up it's not the driver's fault it's ikara's fault so we take full responsibility for customer service in the end, period. We make a mistake, we do our best to fix it. We make a lot of mistakes. We we knew we were going to make a lot of mistakes because we didn't know what we are doing. But we knew that customer service had to be a big part of that. And so as you slow down and put customer service first, it then slows down the driver then that the driver doesn't care about taking ups anymore. The driver now takes in consideration our passenger and the point that they reserved, and there they there they're able to slowly, carefully care for that client. We don't we don't do on demand things. We're a hundred percent scheduled and reserved. That's our game. We don't play anybody else's game. So for our team, they got a schedule. They know. Hey, I'm gonna work ten hours today. I'm gonna do ten reservations, and I'm gonna go home. Uh, and we kind of manage a lot of that with our system and our platform and the algorithms behind it. But at the end of the day, the, the, we kind of built this to be around protecting the driver's time and, and money and interest in, and giving them ability to build their own, right? So a lot of, a lot of the drivers that are on our platform, we, we want to do revenue sharing with them. It's there, it's built in so that, you know, as as the company scales, they actually get to scale too, and they get to make revenue, and they get to share revenue. Um, we've we're now partnering with uh, some automotive dealers to be able to provide cars for those drivers. So now that uh, not only that they get to drive the vehicle and and use it to make money, but then we help them actually own one and and get into it in, in those ways. So. Um, a lot, a lot of, a lot of things that, and that's not even the answer. Honestly, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an ongoing thing. You know, for us, again, the culture is leave everything better than you found it. So that means our team as well. So, you know, we, we, we've, we've got a. You're asking about Ikaro's model now. Again, you can do whatever you want. Most people can build a, a micro mobility platform to do whatever they like. But for Ikara, that's that's what we do. We go through three days of training when somebody's on board it. Uh, we go through three interviews in order to even get uh, to be a part of the guide team. And and then it's a, it's a vote. It's a consensus. Like we all look at each other and go, hey, does this person fit our culture? And if they do, cool. If they don't, cool. And we, we just, you know, just keep going. So that's kind of how we play the game. Um, and we do really cool with that. Like that's kind of how we roll. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I'm curious to hear from uh, Adam and Marcus because you've got kind of a, a different path forward with this with this challenge of electrification, where most drivers are in personal cars that are not all electric yet. So I'm curious to hear from each of you um, what your companies can do to provide programs and incentives to help with this process, but then 
also um, being inclusive in that and in the education and outreach with consideration of factors such as the digital divide and even language barriers, helping drivers with that transition. Marcus, let's start with you. Great, yeah, I think that there's a, a lot of work that continues to be done. And like, I think that when we look at from the Lyft platform side, we've been trying to make partnerships uh, with not only uh, like industry leaders in this, but also governmental leaders, right? In order to, to provide access and provide support for our driver communities and kind of that education piece that I talked a little bit about earlier. Example, in Colorado, we worked with the legislator there um, in order to, on our Express Drive platform, which is our rental program, where we rent cars uh, to drivers that wish to be on the platform and to make money that don't have their own vehicles, we were able to launch 200 Express Drive vehicles that are electric vehicles on the platform instead of gas um, vehicles. Uh, and then that's really kind of taking that step to start educating those drivers about like kind of what the vehicles have to offer and then kind of like long-term hopes that maybe they would then be able to purchase their own electric vehicle. Another thing is like working with educating our drivers regarding the availability of rebate programs and incentives that they may have if they're going to then make their own purchase um, of an electric vehicle. And I think that that's really key too, because oftentimes, even when I talk to riders uh, in my car, when I'm out driving uh, about kind of like, I got an EV, but my electric company also gave a rebate for me to install the charger at my house. And so it really only cost me a $100 net to have a, a fast charger at my house uh, versus plugging into the wall and only getting like four to five miles per hour. I can get closer to 35 to 40 miles per hour with that charger through that rebate program. And even my neighbor who ended up getting an electric vehicle, he didn't know that that rebate existed. So what you to do with not only manufacturers, but also the politicians in the world to make things available and then kind of spread that information around our platform with our drivers. It's great to hear what you guys are working on, Marcus. This is a, a fun thing to compete on and a good thing to be uh, doing right by drivers and, and helping their, them shift. For us, uh, uh, similar to, to Lyft, we've made a commitment to 100% EV uh, on the platform by 2030. If we hung a sign out uh, on the app tomorrow that said, you can only work here if you drive an EV, we'd basically ensure that uh, we had 99% uh, of drivers wouldn't be able to participate with us. And those that did would more likely to be white, wealthy, and, and uh, come from uh, well-served neighborhoods. So. We can't do that. It would be bad for our business. It would be bad for drivers. It would be bad for communities and nobody would, would see any emission savings from it. So our objective is to bring everybody along in this transition and, and it has to be a fair and just one to do that. So what we did was we committed to making 800 million in total resources available to drivers to help 100, uh, several hundred thousand make the switch to EVs over the next five years at the 2025. And we're doing that in three ways, education, savings and earnings. So let me double click on each of those. So education wise, uh, I, I, I like the way Marcus put it and uh, Raven touched upon it as well. It's difficult to underst understate the, the need for education here, not because people don't know or, or, or don't want to know, but because people are busy and uh, it's hard to understand uh, all the different terms that are thrown at them by those of us who have been on the in the industry for a long time. So we don't want to underestimate what that education is going to take. We launched a first tool with Zappy Ride, <laughs> their uh, technology provider that helps make it real easy to put in your address put in your zip code and find out what incentives are available to you right now. They have a tool with us on uh, uber.zappy.com that you can figure out, here's the vehicle I'm in today. I'm interested in a Bolt or a Tesla or a Hyundai uh, or a Kia Nero tomorrow. And I, I can understand what uh, what the cost differences or cost savings would be to me to, to make that switch. So we're really proud and happy to offer that tool. We've got a long way to go on this and, and we've got a lot to do, particularly to adapt those tools and make sure that we're using language that uh, works for folks and works and meets them where they are, not only on their journey on electric, but uh, where they are physically, literally in the world, uh, what neighborhoods they're from and, and groups and, and backgrounds they're from. So we have a lot of work to do on that. 
Piece two is savings. Here it's all about partnership. Um, our CEO, Dara, likes to say that climate's a team sport, and we certainly recognize humbly that we are not going to get there on our own. So we partner with automakers, with rental companies, with EV charging providers, with policy advocacy groups um, to uh, put together a portfolio of options for drivers to make it easier to make the switch. Uh, most drivers face not only an initial hurdle to get into the car because it costs more, uh, but also they face uh, a hurdle in terms of earning in the vehicle. You're right, Lindsay, that it can uh, your, your costs can be lower in an EV, but one of the phenomenon that we've seen in talking to drivers is they miss out on earnings opportunities when looking for charging and plugging in the vehicle. It can be as much as a 25% headwind uh, to earnings versus, say, their used Prius-owning neighbor who has 600 miles in the tank and can replenish it in five minutes at any corner gas station. So we've got some work to do to make uh, drivers, uh, it's easier for drivers to save on, any, uh, on a vehicle and then save on, on the charging. So you may have heard of the partnership that we launched with Hertz to make 50,000 Teslas available uh, to drivers on a rental basis. A lot of drivers come to us and say, I don't have a car or I don't have a car that uh, complies with local regulations or I, I don't want to use the car I have and I'm looking for a solution. This is for them. We've, we've worked with, with Hertz to get the price down uh, to an all-in cost equivalent to uh, a, a gasoline vehicle of, a, of the same premium category. So we're pleased to offer that and it, it uh, dovetails with other uh, partnerships we've done with, say, EVgo to help drivers save up to 30% on their fast charging network around the country. The last piece is earnings. Uh, we want drivers in EVs to ultimately earn more than their fossil driving peers. Um, uh, it was mentioned many times on this call with Raven and Rock and Kamasi are talking about how um, some of it comes down to the money. Uh, and we want to not only make it transparent, easy to know what you're earning, but we want to offer sweeteners if you're in an EV. So we have a $1 per trip EV incentive that's available to all drivers in the U.S. and Canada uh, over the next, we just did an extension through next year. Uh, we also have an Uber Green product available in more than 100 urban markets through North America and Europe, where drivers can earn uh, in the U.S. and Canada 50 cents more for every trip that they, they complete, and all EV drivers are eligible for an Uber Green trip. Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, really interesting to hear about the different angles that we need to approach this to make this more accessible to drivers. Um, I'm curious to hear from Kamasu, out of all these various approaches, what do you think sounds approachable to most drivers? I mean, they're all great solutions. And I think it's, it's amazing to hear that, um, you know, the platforms are working on it from different angles. And I mean, it's it's a multi-pronged problem, so it's going to take a multi-pronged solution. Um, one of the things definitely, um, as Adam touched on, it is charging. Um, you know, as drivers are kind of getting into this and they're, you know, because driving an electric vehicle and how you manage your charging versus your driving time is very different than how you would normally manage it in a gas vehicle where it's a little bit more haphazardly in a gas vehicle. There is a charger, you know, I mean, or a gas station kind of on every corner versus chargers are usually centrally located in certain pockets of cities. And then as you start to get to more in the outskirts and the suburbs, they start to become a little more sparse. So it, you know, it does take a little bit more of a thought process, but it doesn't make it impossible. Um, as I mentioned before, I've done all of my uh, tenure at Uber as an electric driver. So it definitely can be done, but you know, it definitely takes a little bit more thought process. And that one's when the education comes into and helping the drivers really understand the product that they're utilizing and then how to best utilize that tool for their needs and their business. Um, so charging is gonna be huge, the infrastructure, because um, right even right now with where most chargers are located, a lot of chargers are located, even when they are a, kind of in a centralized location, it's still almost in like a no man's land or it's in an area where it's not really connected to any type of retail services, which then you have no other type of facility. So versus like a gas station of a driver goes in, fills up with gasoline, they're going to go ahead. Now they, they're now they're a paying customer of that gas station and then they can go in and they can use, say, the restroom and things like that versus where you might find a charger or a bank of chargers. It may be in a remote parking lot. Well, now the driver is at this parking lot. The vehicle is charging, but there's no facility for them. They can't use the restroom. They can't 
wash their hands. They can't get a snack. They can't do these things. So then they have to go to either another location separate from where their vehicle is charging, but now their vehicle is there. So how do they get to this other location? Um, or if their charger is near, say, a location where there is like a retail space and they, but they don't actually necessarily need anything, they actually, a lot of times they might be denied, you know, access to the restroom from that facility or that business thinking, well, you're not one of our paying customers, even though, you know, the business or the employee working at that business may not realize that, say that charger that's paid for by it's, whether it's EVgo or ChargePoint or Blink or whomever, that corporation, EVgo is paying the retailer, say Longs or CVS, they're paying for space in that parking lot. So, so EVgo has paid Longs or CVS money to have that parking space. So therefore, by the driver utilizing this charger and paying for the charge, they actually are a paying customer of CVS, but it, you know, it's kind of a roundabout and there's always, so there's that disconnect as well. So it's really going to come down to supporting the drivers and infrastructure and just trying to figure out how, how do we close that gap between what the driver needs, the charging infrastructure, and then other access to other things that come along with charging your vehicle, like say a restroom. Yeah, all really good points. Thank you so much. Um, you know, another thing around chargers, uh, locations of chargers, a couple things that come to mind is there are just fewer charging stations proximal to where more drivers live as compared to where they tend to work and charge throughout the day. So there's a variable. And then another variable with charging stations that I've heard about from drivers is you know, safety concerns as well, um, reliability of chargers. So I'm really curious to hear from um, TNC operators here, what kind of you know, on-call support can drivers um, get in those moments where they're at a charging station and there's a challenging situation? I'm happy to offer a little bit of observations and experience here, Lindsay. Uh, first, we, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to diligence and understand who are the best providers that we can partner with. So uh, we have a, a longstanding partnership now with EVgo, and uh, they announced a, a kind of doubling down of that relationship whereby drivers can access a deeper savings and discounts on their network, uh, but ensuring that we can find providers that do, are offering that level of service and that level of uptime. It's tricky. The policy space, um, you know, for the last 20 years has really focused on installation. And so all the government dollars have gone out to say, please, please create charging. We need to cast a wide net because we've got a chicken and egg problem and we got to get a bunch of chickens out there. I'm not sure which it's one. Um, uh, but because of that, you've got a lot of chargers that are broken. Uh, they're not used. Uh, government dollars have been mostly on the installation, not on the use of those uh, stations. And so uh, the incentives uh, at this point in the game now are a little bit off. And I would suggest um, that there's a great opportunity for policymakers, for local cities, for utilities to start uh, considering not only ride hail, but commercial drivers in general as, uh, as a segment of drivers, as a user segment that they've not listened to yet, that they've not heard mm -hmm. from yet, that they've not built uh, places for. Uh, to Kamasu's point, uh, when we talk to drivers and we talk to our providers, a lot of fast charging has been built at high-end retail because they assume that, uh, and they would be right to assume in many cases that the EVs are mostly owned by private owners where the EV is their third or fourth car uh, and they're going to high-end establishments. And many of those high-end retailers have said, we don't want TNC drivers. We don't want ride hail drivers coming. It's a classist assumption. They assume that they're not coming to, to get uh, to purchase something or maybe a meal or something like that. Um, but we need to start to break that open because the policy space has not recognized that there's now more users out there and that many of those users are these early adopters using ride hail networks, other types of, uh, of local solutions like what Rock and Raven are creating. Uh, and they they need access to charging too. And they're driving more miles. They're bringing more emissions benefits. They're bringing their neighbors, friends, and visitors to the city around an e-mobility. So they're offering a lot of good. And it's a great opportunity for all of us to try and re-square the conversation, see what can we do to learn from drivers and cater to their needs. I would plus one to everything that Adam just mentioned. Uh, really 
from what the conversations have been with drivers on our side, we've had some of those similar conversations about the fact that not only does the driver have to go to an area where they may not be as familiar with to charge, but they may feel less um, safe and feel vulnerable in that community um, where they are not familiar with. Um, and oh, so well. one of the things that, what was that? Come on. You were you were muted there, so I didn't hear that. So, so. It's or awesome. piggyback on that, or feeling like you said safe, or actually, or feeling welcome, feeling not yep. welcome in that community. Totally. And so, like, how how do we really kind of like disconnect and put chargers where the drivers live so that they can charge? I have drivers that have electric vehicles um, on some of our on our platform that have to go charge somewhere because they don't have a home charger. And that's like 18 to 20 miles from where their house is. Um, and so they're having to suspend that extra time. Um, safety, we think about not only our trust and safety team is always there to support folks um, and well, as well as our partnership with ADT, um, but that's only one component um, that we can provide, but we have to really focus on kind of that infrastructure as well as kind of that, that normalizing that EVs are for everyone in the community. And so like Adam was mentioning as well, like this is going to be a spot where lots of folks will be a lot of different um, people with different backgrounds uh, will be in that area um, to charge. So I think that we have lots of work to continue to do in that area. Yeah, I'm going to give a completely different take on this um, because I think that there is some danger in, in shaping the conversation like this that um you know certain people aren't welcome and certain people feel like they can't do this and certain people don't have the information being a latina female i've had many people in the space say well why do you feel like you can go against large rideshare one i don't feel like i'm going against and two what is my um who i am have anything to do with the narrative um you know for for us we really focus on empowering people that regardless of who you are and your lifestyle and your education that electric vehicles are for everyone. And that's kind of where I hope that we focus the narrative on is like, how can we make sure that we're empowering people, even in the way that we speak, because the more you focus on, you know, she's a female Latina, the more I'm gonna feel like, okay, well, does that mean I'm something different? So, you know, just being, being cognizant of the fact of how we're shaping the conversation and making people feel welcome, regardless of what, they're, what they look like. Hundred percent, hundred percent. That's some powerful shit, Raven. I love it. You know, this is the deal. There is no one way. There is no right way, right? There's a there's a one trillion dollar tsunami happening, and nobody's prepared for it, right? I mean, we think we are. We we we're we're going in a, we're going in, a, in in some direction, but there is no right way, and I think when you take that approach that Raven just said, where you start to focus on people, this is not about ride sharing. This is, this is about life, mobility, moving people, connections, relationships. That's what this is about. Learning, you know, education. And so these brands, like we'll figure out how to charge and how to keep charge and how to make sure our teams are, you know, informed, but it's it's just about starting with taking care of people and forget like like with Raven Sand, it's really just, you know, anybody can do this. It, it's not rocket science. People do rocket science, but this is not it. And uh, it, it's really about taking care of people. And I think there is a massive amount of opportunity. It's immense. It's bigger than all of us. No one company can do it all. And there's no verses in this game. This is the one thing that we got to do right together. Like if there's one thing that we got to put all our crap aside and do right together, this got to be it. <laughs> so it's like there are many, 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 many answers to that question that you mentioned. And there is so much ambiguity right now that I, I was saying it the other day. I could just retire now and just keep driving my electric car the way I drive it. And every single day I'm going to learn something new to be able to bring input. But just I'm just going to give up and just retire and drive my car and, and be a consultant, just like Kamasu, because there's so much ambiguity and there's so much 
things that people have no idea on how to do this or that. And, um, and, and, and the opportunities to learn and grow are just immense. And that's probably why, you know, Elon said, I want to start in a, you know, electrical engineering school because there's just not enough capacity for what's about to happen. There's 300 million gasoline vehicles in the United States alone with less than 200 or less than 2 million electric vehicles. Now, let's just say we get to a third of that. Right. A hundred million electric cars. Do you, we all know the infrastructure that has to happen for a hundred million electric cars to be running around in our cities and states. Massive. And anybody who has anything to do with that and doing it with some compassion and, um, you know, integrity and, you know, care and customer service, anybody who's playing that game in that manner has an opportunity to win, you know, for both sides, for, for, for the, for the drivers, the, you know, that are operators that are doing this and for the, the passengers and the clients that they're serving. It's, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity there and the, and, the, and the cost to operate let's not even talk about that for a second because the the premiums are so high now on something that is fundamentally easy to do it shouldn't cost any more than a dollar 75 to move people in the united states shouldn't cost any more than that right now premiums for most rides are in the three dollar to 325 325 rate so look at the gap that you have using electric vehicles in the in the revenue holy crap you could do it at one fifty. Now I could charge three dollars and still do it. Like it's so it's there's a lot of opportunity. So so anyway, just don't give me the r- r- ranting. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Great stuff though. Great stuff. Great stuff. It's awesome. Yeah, I'm curious, Kamasu, what are your take on these uh, these comments? No, I mean Raven. Like, you know, she totally nailed it because it is, it can be done by anyone. And it's truly about just learning and making people feel welcome and inclusive and just helping people understand the space and that a lot of the hurdles or obstacles they may believe are there, aren't there. Um, You know, and the electric vehicle itself, although it's a tool, obviously, for the transportation, it's a huge tool for starting conversations, opening lines of dialogue, education on back and forth, creating different connections. Um, I mean, I've, you know, as Rock was saying, I've, I've built my whole consulting business around electric cars and it's literally, most of it's came from rideshare amount, the amount of just helping people because it's as you've, you know, as, as he said, there's so much happening this, as you figure out one caveat, it opens up to understanding the three or four or five, the next six that are coming and just really plugging people in and the amount of conversations and relationships that I've built um, in and out of the vehicle or around the vehicle, it's huge. And it's just going to continue to keep growing. Huge. This is like the one kind of business model where you have interaction with people exclusively for a certain period of time. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's really it's really interesting in that fact. So whatever happens in that period of time kind of is the most important thing, I guess. Right. It can be really impactful for sure. Matsu, you said plugging people in, and it makes me think of um, the platforms evolving to support drivers doing that as well. What driver? What information drivers are given on the app? Um, that could help with being uh, not only like the outreach and education about electric cars, but also supporting drivers that are in electric cars. Let's talk about that for a bit. I don't know who wants to start it off, Raven. Sure. Yeah. Um, You know, kind of goes back to my first point of drivers needing to be aware of their financial situation. Um, I think it's interesting when we talk about these rental programs. I remember my, my mother, I was, my mother was a single mother and she worked three jobs. She would leave to go all the way, I think midnight or 2 AM. And I was eight years old. I'd be by myself. And her, her brother wrecked her car, her paid for car. And she had to buy, I remember being at CarMax and she had to make a life decision on a Sunday because she had to go to work on Monday. And I think the car was like $8,000 and it almost broke her. And so to think about these rental programs, and I know I'm I'm kind of getting off the question, but think about these rental programs, it puts people in a very 
tight financial situation that is really looping because rental isn't ownership and ownership to me is the true embodiment of financial freedom when it comes to owning a vehicle comes to owning a car comes to owning assets or stock or whatever the case may be so you know i think it's very important to get people towards the the notion of ownership um, of a vehicle or of just their financial situation and so as we continue to electrify the transportation sector people need to understand best practices you know i recently had someone at tesla say hey are you turning off your agenda braking every now and then and i i'm pretty savvy i've changed some tires i've changed the brakes like I've, I've done my thing right um i was like no why and he's like well you know that that dust is building up and i was like oh crap like i didn't think of that and so i mean how many of other drivers like Adam said, they're they're so busy. They're living their day to day life. They've got so much going on. Maybe this is a side job, and they've got five kids at home. Who knows? They're not thinking about these little things. And you know, as technology companies, we can build this in the app. Hey, I see you've driven two thousand miles. We recommend going ahead and for the next you know ten rides, turning off regenerative braking. Also, when was the last time you checked your tires? Little things like this, because. If we can get ahead of the curve for fleet maintenance and just one car maintenance, it's going to go a long way for these drivers who really rely on this income. So I, I would say being more um, proactive when it comes to information around the, the EV, I think would be really helpful in the future. Same, yeah, uh, I would concur. Go, go ahead. ahead, Marcus. I, I, I concur, like really kind of like helping educate as to kind of like like where you are in that life cycle of your car and like kind of the maintenance component of it. Like, because I think about like the fact that like while Raven, I applaud you for being able to do those things. I cannot do those things. Um, I can barely remember to put windshield wiper fluid in my car. Um, but I think that, that that is something that we have to continue to get down that path of. We also have to think about like kind of really kind of the information even when they're out there on the platform. Uh, unlike like Rock talked about his platform as being kind of like a scheduled based kind of um, a platform, whereas like when you're out on rideshare, um, it's kind of a, like on demand. And so you never know always when you're going to get that next ride and where that ride is going to end up taking you. And so kind of how we think about kind of that education and that putting that information in the hands of drivers. Um, and then later, is there ways that we can integrate more so with the driver's cars long term down the road of like how much charge do they have and so maybe we're not even putting the the driver in a position where they may um have a ride that is going to go outside of their range um that will take them um and so things like that are things that are top of mind when i'm talking to drivers with our um, driver advisory council as things that lyft is having conversations about as to what we can be doing in that space Rock, it seemed as though earlier you had some more to add on this as well. Yeah, I was I was just going to echo what everybody's saying and, and to the degree that there's it's probably no one way of, of figuring that out. You know, I think there's 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 got to be different approaches to this. And and, and I think we all uh, collectively I'm going to go back to that because we all got to work together to this I think collectively as we do our jobs and as we you know are passionate about what we're doing we remove those barriers in different ways you know um, I think there'll be thousands of business models uh, honestly I think that there'll be you know I think the future is going to bring opportunity for you know millions of people to create their own you know ways of solving that problem and i think that's the cool thing about what happened after the pandemic is everybody's zero zero you know everybody has the opportunity to play and i love that opportunity i love that idea and everybody has the opportunity to solve those problems so um you know if if, if everybody in this on this call wanted to go buy a hundred thousand electric cars guess what we can. We just have to get in line, just like everybody else. So that was one of the reasons why this is important for us, right? To do is because there there is no answers yet, and so I feel like as we continue to collaborate and work through these, you know, issues and gain our our knowledge from doing different things as companies, as individuals, uh, as consultants, and then 
sharing those learns is ridiculously important. You know, that's that's just my input. I think that there's so like we 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 love sharing what we learn. Honestly, uh, nobody's really listening listening to us yet. It's okay, but we love sharing <laughs> what we learn, and we love learning. So. Uh, it's and I'm sure you guys do too. I'm sure you guys are in that same place where in the sustainability space, you love what you do and you love the learning part, but you also uh, love that informing and awareness piece. And I think that's kind of what we all are doing as well, you know, in that awareness piece around all of the variables as it pertains to drivers and cars and electric and charging and all this new information. So um, I'm really excited about this this talk uh, as it pertains to the diversity of solving the problems, not just the diversity of people who are uh, doing the problem solving. Well, that's, a, that was, that's a great piece that you brought up, Marcus, um, as far as like really understanding and having the TNC really collecting that data. Because I mean, between the metrics that are being collected by the ride sharing app and then the amount of the telematics that are coming from the vehicle, as we start to get deeper and deeper into this electrification of ride platforms like Uber and Lyft, those things can be integrated. You know, where as as the rides that are populating into the driver's app, and you know that the vehicle is an electric vehicle, you know what kind of car they're driving. So you have a, you already have a base range of that car. So you know if that person that driver is driving a Chevy Bolt, and they've been on for so long, you can see on from your end, you can see how many rides they've done, where those, you know, where those rides have began and ended. Obviously, there's you know, there's some variance in there with region and, and other things like that, but you have a general idea. So as rides start populating, you know, and you with the partnerships with chargers, with like charge point or EV Go, then you can you can almost give drivers that information, like, hey, we have a ride for you, and this ride is going to take you from say downtown San Francisco to Palo Alto. And we know that's going to put you towards the end of our range, or towards the end of your range, you're going to need to charge. And what we've done is we've calculated about when you should be arriving at that location. And we reserved a spot for you at the EV Go station at the Whole Foods on, you know, West West Adam Avenue or, or what have you. So that way the rider ha the driver has more confidence in saying, yeah, oh, cool, I'll take this ride, knowing that it's going to take me down to Palo Alto. That's going to put me in the lower portion of my range but when i get there i'm not going to spend time either driving around looking for a charger or once i find a charger waiting and hoping i can get in the queue so knowing that if i take this ride this ride takes me to palo alto and uber or lyft or whoever has already set something up for me after i drop the ride i have a 15 minute window to get to this charger where i have a, a reservation i pull in I maximize my downtime, get right to the charger, charge, get my vehicle back up, and then go back to my earnings. So, you know, you touched on that, Marcus, and that's something that should be really, really deepened and, and looked into and expanded upon. Absolutely. So uh, we have three minutes left. This has gone really quickly. Uh, I want to uh, ask a question at least from the q a side thank you so much panelists for um your qu great questions here um jen is asking rack and raven have any of your employees after driving evs for your company later become ev owners themselves yeah riders and drivers we've had both um we've had everything yeah, that that's that was like uh, so. <laughs> when we first started, um, we did B two B, so it was B two B stuff. Like we went to the Amazons of the world, and you know, and said, "Hey, can we move your people in electric cars?" And we plant a tree every time somebody ride. So that worked really well. And and so after our first year, we realized that um, ninety seven percent of the people that had ridden in our cars had never been in a an electric car before we were doing these surveys as we were trying to understand and then the same survey we would ask you know you know a few weeks later would you consider buying an electric car and so uh 95 percent of those people said they would buy an electric car on their next purchase all things considering so then we had this aha moment about like what the power of what we were doing as it pertains to influence like 
giving people opportunity to experience all electric cars. So then we kind of built that and baked that into the platform. And then we realized that the drivers that were coming from the really expensive vehicles that operate like the SUVs, like those are the ones that were immediately like, I want to buy this. Uh, I can buy this. I want to buy. I want to buy this. Uh, it's like crazy. It's like 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 it was. It was just just, just it still is like. And and it's just simply because if if you drive an electric car for a week making money and you never stop at the gas station one time, whereas last month you were driving a you know, you a Yukon or a Tahoe or a big SUV, and you were stopping at the gas station every two or three days, you get to kind of see that 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 makes a big difference. And so it, I think from a driver's perspective, we've had that happen only because of the cost to operate. They could see that immediately. From a rider's perspective, it's about the experience and, and people see that somewhat immediately. So I think Raven and all, everybody who, you know, Uber and Hertz and like all of these companies that are gonna, like remember 300,000 or sorry, 300 million gasoline vehicles, we're at 2 million electric. So most people have, ne- there's, a, there's massive amounts of people that have never been in an electric car. So the opportunities, to pe- bring awareness are immense. It's huge. It's huge. Like I, I'm still appalled that there's some people that really don't know like Apple operating system. <laughs> you know, it's like you say what? Like you. <laughs> so there's so it's it's immense. It's immense. It's immense. And so uh, yeah, I think uh, we have a, a duty. A duty. This is this is a duty. It's, it's a responsibility of ours to inform people and help them, guide them to getting these cars. We have no choice. This is not even about us at all. This is about my this is about my five year old daughter and my two year old son, who I am desperately spending the rest of my life with trying to help give them a place to reside in 40 years. So that's that's. Yes, that's I, I go yes, yes, yes on getting people to you know buy electric cars and understand what they do, and then take those electric cars and don't put them into a garage and underutilize them. There's 17,000 registered uh, EVs in the city that I live in, and I guarantee you they're they're we're at about 35 to 40 percent utilization. Those cars are parked 60 percent of the time. If we could take those vehicles, right? and you utilize them another 30%, you got 60% utilization out of 14,000 electric cars right now. So these are the kind of things that we need to start talking about. Like, let's freaking go. We've been talking about this for a long time, right? We've been talking about this for too damn long. You know, it's time to go. Like, it's no reason to say, you know, we can wait to this and that. Let's let's do it. Let's do it. I let's, agree, Rock. Let's make Thank the you. Oh, right, Rock. It is. Right? It's true. And people really look. People really, like Rock was saying, they look to you. The people really, I mean, you be, like as Rock said, you become almost an evangelist about electric vehicles and people come to you. They follow you. Um, I have an Instagram page just around um, electric vehicles and ride share and things like that, which Green Brother EV. And I have people who follow me that were riders who then hit me up. Hey, I'm thinking about buying this car. What do you think about this? And, you know, I, I, my neighbor just got this. What do I do? How do I solve this problem? So those people are really looking to you as an expert. And as Rock was saying, it's just it's really up to us to kind of get that information out to people and just really help with the transition and people kind of getting in there. So. Yes, yes. So we are really officially out of time. But Raven, Adam, Marcus, I'm going to challenge you for one sentence parting thought on this topic and center the driver in that as well. Drivers as evangelists for electric mobility and inclusive mobility. I'll echo what Rock said. Drivers are reducing the carbon out of the transportation equation and we look forward to seeing you on earth. We're only just at the tip of the iceberg at what we can do together by electrifying not only our drivers out there, but the world. And this is just the tip. So I thank everybody for today.
Oh, I, I thank you all as well. Thank you so much, Marcus, Adam, Kamasu, Rock, and Raven. Um, thank you for sharing your thoughts, your experiences, your expertise. Uh, I look forward to seeing this issue evolve together. And thanks to the panelists who have stuck around. And uh, thank you for your time today and your great questions, too. Have a good rest of the day.